Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone on this beautiful, at least in Seattle, beautiful Wednesday noon. My name is Beth Gloston and I'm a board member for Washington's National Park Fund or WNPF. And it's my pleasure to be here today to moderate our journey to the North Cascades National Park to learn about the Cascades Butterfly Project. More about that in a moment, but first uh, a little bit about WNPF. It's an organization uh, that was started in the 1990s whose purpose is to raise money for our amazing three national parks in Washington State, Mount Rainier, Olympic, and North Cascades. The organization is supported by a 23 member board of directors and seven highly capable staff people led by CEO Lori Ward. Each year, the organization works closely with park superintendents to identify priority projects for each of the three parks. And then we set out to raise funds to allow those projects to go forward. And that's where you come in. Um, you are our um, avid supporters are what make this uh, organization survive and thrive. And in fact, next week is a great opportunity for you to do that as we have our online auction running from Monday the 19th at four o'clock through Friday the 23rd at seven. There's some amazing packages. I'll say a few more words at the end, but something for everyone on our online auction this year and we'll end our celebration of the parks um, next week at seven o'clock on Friday with a gathering, a virtual gathering, where we'll again hear from Regina Rochefort, our speaker today. But now on to our today's presentation, a couple of details. This, this uh, field trip today will run till about 12.45 uh, with a 30 minute presentation. And there'll be time at the end for some questions. As you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We also have closed captioning available to you, which is accessed again at the bottom of your screen. Um, and at, at the end of our trip, if you have any feedback, please let us know. So, is your lunch packed? Got your water bottle? Lace up your boots for our hike to the North Cascades. Uh, we'll be taking a bus there and on the way. Uh, on our WNPF bus, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Regina Rochefort, uh, retired from the North Cascades National Park of April of 2018. But as you'll see, she's kept very active with the parks. She's had a 40 year career with the National Park Service before working at North Cascades as the science advisor. She was the first botanist at Mount Rainier National Park. And while working at Mount Rainier, she completed her PhD at the University of Washington studying the effects of climate change on subalpine and alpine plant communities. So take it away, Dr. Rochefort, uh, the Cascades Butterfly Project. Okay, well, thanks. It's great to be here with you this afternoon, and I'm really excited to give you a little overview of the Cascades Butterfly Project. The CBP, or Cascades Butterfly Project, is a long-term monitoring program that was established in 2011 to monitor the effects of climate change on subalpine ecosystems. We use butterflies and plant phenology or flowering times as indicators. And we conduct our surveys in North Cascades and Mount Rainier National Parks, as well as Mount Baker Snoqualmie and Okanagan Wenatchee National Forests. So one of the primary drivers of this project was climate change. Climate scientists tell us that we can expect average annual temperatures to increase in the Pacific Northwest by as much as six degrees by 2050. With this increase in temperature, we know we expect to see plants and animals changing their distribution and abundance and ecosystem processes to be altered. This means for us as national park employees, in order to remain good stewards of the lands we protect, we really need to know what's happening, what the changes are, and then adapt our management to these new conditions. 
The graph you see on the, on the screen was made by Dr. Patrick Gonzalez, and he's a lead climate scientist for the National Park Service. This particular graph is for North Cascades, but he's made one of these graphs for every park to help with long-term management strategies. So just to orient you to this graph, the bottom axis is years, and it goes from about 1890 up to 2010, and the y-axis is centigrade degrees. The dotted line that you can see across here is the average annual temperature over this 100-year time period. The black, dark black line is a five-year running average on temperature. And you can see on the left half of the screen especially, temperatures go up and down above average. We have hot years, we have cool years, but we pretty much flutter right about average until we get to 1950. You can see from 1950 up to 2010, the highs often are a little higher than they were before 1950. And the lows are often also higher. So if we tried to draw a straight line through the second half of this century, that's what the red line would be. And you can see that average annual temperature has been increasing since 1950 and we expect it to continue to increase. So that's what we're trying to get ready for. What will our parks look like and how can we best manage them? Our project focuses on subalpine ecosystems. And the reason we've selected subalpine is because they are particularly vulnerable, subalpine and alpine, to warming climates. As we know, our typical climate in the Northwest is long winters with deep snowpack, followed by short, mild summers. And in the subalpine, we know that most of the moisture that comes to the plants comes from these melting snowpacks. Well, climate scientists tell us that our future will have lower snowpacks and longer and drier growing seasons. And this is because even if we still receive the same amount of precipitation, precipitation that falls in November, say, October, April, that will all come as rain. So we're going to have less snow falling and lower snowpacks. This picture on the screen is of Clapache Park at Mount Rainier National Park. And I think I took it in about 1988 at the end of July. And what I really wanted to point out was snow is still there in July and snow really determines where plants are on the landscape or different plant communities. You can see the subalpine firs are primarily on little hills. They melt out earlier, they're drier, and they have a longer growing season. All the snow patches in between generally cover up the lush herbaceous flower fields we're used to seeing or wet sedge meadows. But all of this may change with earlier snow melt. So what do we expect? We expect to see changes in plant and animal distributions. We've already seen glacier loss. We expect to see more of that. And we expect to see trees moving higher up in elevation. However, we do know we see short-term interannual change as well as long-term. These two pictures are from Cascade Pass. The one on the left was taken in July of 2014, and the one on the right, June of 2015. And you can see, even though the 2015 photo was a month earlier in the year, there was much less snow in the valleys and on the slopes. And if you remember 2015, that was the year that we had very low snowpacks and snow melted up to three weeks earlier in many places in the Cascades. So similar to temperature change over time, we're really interested in the trends in snowpack. This is a graph from Paradise showing the snow water equivalent from 1940 to 2020. And snow water equivalent is a good way to look at snowpack because you have dry years and wet years. But if you melt it all down, that's a snow water equivalent. So we're seeing where we're comparing likes to likes for each year. And you can see on this, we have ups and downs 
but the trend line is lower snowpacks, just as the climate scientists have been projecting. When these trends continue the way that graph showed us, then we see longer, longer term changes, not just in plants and animals, but in glaciers. And this is a photo, there are a pair of photos from North Cascades National Park, the Buckner Glacier. And you can see 1960 compared to 2005, the glacier is much smaller and also um, it's less deep in 2005. So what else have we seen? Well, we've seen a 53% loss in glacial area in North Cascades since 1900. We've seen freezing level rise and we've also seen forest level rise. So Goody Mountain is the highest point in North Cascades. And a study done by Tessa Brookman showed that since 1958, forest line has risen 127 meters in that area. A similar study by Kirk Stuvey in Mount Rainier National Park showed the same pattern of tree level rising in elevation. And sometimes we don't really notice when we see this because we almost need time lapse photography to show us. So this is a paradise meadow from the upper parking lot. You're looking at Alta Vista on the right. And each of these arrows points roughly to the same area of the meadow. In 1950, you can see there were very few trees there. When we go down to the lower left photo, in 1992, you can see there are trees and shrubs coming in. And by 19, um, 2012, in the lower right, they're getting even taller. Now, some of you may be familiar that with this area of the meadow and say, ah, but there were tent cabins there too. And that disturbance may alter the, the plant community and the tree establishment. But this is the best photo set of photos I could find from Mount Rainier, but it's happening all over Mount Rainier, not just where there were tent cabins. And the same can be seen when you're standing at Cascade Pass in North Cascades and you look up towards Sahali Arm. So the Cascades Butterfly Project has both short and long-term objectives. On the short term, we really wanted to know what butterflies do we have in each of the parks? Although we had some records for Mount Rainier, we didn't have very many for North Cascades. And you know, if you want to know how much the um, parks are changing, you have to have a baseline. So we had to develop our own baseline of species lists and abundance. We also wanted to begin on our journey of really understanding what climate change, what effect it was having. So that was a start. And also to communicate these effects to people that we see in the field and to park managers as we learn them. In the long term, we wanted to see how trends in butterfly abundance or emergence time, that's when they um, emerge out of their chrysalis and start flying. When does that change? Is it changing in the time of year? But we knew we needed to have multiple years of monitoring. So that's why it's a long-term goal. We also wanted to see when did flowering times change because this has been used as a measure all over the world. So before we go on, we wanted to get an idea of how much you know about butterflies and moths and can you tell the difference? So Casey's put up a quick um, poll for you to answer. Oh, I think you all did pretty well. So um, the actual answer is that butterfly do have ball shapes at the end of their antenna and moths do rest with open wings generally and butterflies with closed wings. And I would say even though a lot of moths fly at night, there are a few out there in the day. And last year I received a lot of questions from people about these black and white moths that seem to be very abundant called police car moths. 
You also may be familiar with a brown and red moth, the cinnabar moth that was released as a biocontrol for tansy ragwort. So, and then of course there are luna moths that are beautiful and sheep's moths. So you might keep an eye out this year for those. But in our project, we are just focusing on butterflies. Okay, so why did we select butterflies and plants? Well, we selected them for a variety, for several reasons, but they're both very, very um, sensitive to temperature. Butterflies develop going from egg to larvae to pupae to chrysalis to, butter, to full butterfly uh, based on temperature. Plant flowering is often also based on temperature thresholds. Another reason was because they're both easy to learn. There are a lot of great guides out there for butterflies and they're a little easier to learn than you might think, or at least they were for me when I started because I'm a plant ecologist rather than a lepidopterist. They're also monitored around the world. So this gives us the ability that when we want to report on the patterns we see, we can compare it somewhere else to see are our conditions changing at the same rate or earlier or later than others. I guess, and lastly, although butterflies and plants do depend on each other, butterflies are not the most important pollinator up in the subalpine. That really goes to bees, surfeit flies, and ants, but those are a little more difficult to um, learn. But many studies have shown that the trends of butterflies, say moving, their distribution or their emergence time is very close to what other pollinators do. So it's a good indicator for us. So as I mentioned, we are conducting surveys in Mount Rainier and North Cascades and the two forests that are adjacent to North Cascades. So on this map, you can see at the top, this is North Cascades National Park and we have two sites there, Cascade Pass and Easy Pass. Maple Pass is right on the border of North Cascades and Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest. And then in Mount Baker, Snoqualmie National Forest, we're surveying its Skyline Divide and Sauk Mountain. Down in Mount Rainier, we have five sites, Spray Park, Skyscraper, Sunrise Rim, Natchez Loop, and Mazama Ridge. All of our sites are in the subalpine on designated trails, and we selected the sites based on distance from trailhead so we could easily reach them in a day. And that's why we have more sites in Mount Rainier because it's a little more accessible than the North Cascades. To give you a little bit of a picture of our sites, I have eight of them here. Um, Sunrise Rim and Skyscraper in Mount Rainier in the Northeast corner. Mazama Ridge on the lower left picture is down um, in the Paradise area. And Natchez Loop on the right side is right by Tipsu Lake. In the Northern Cascades, Skyline Divide is in Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest. Maple Pass is on the east side. You can see a Alpine Larch here in the photo. Easy Pass is very close to Maple Pass, but it's in um, North Cascades. That's our most challenging site to, to reach. And Cascade Pass is right on the Cascade Crest in North Cascades. So how do we survey? We have two types of surveys. We have qualitative surveys and quantitative surveys. As I mentioned, we didn't have a very good inventory to begin this project. And the qualitative surveys, the photographs, really help us expand our inventory. And the qualitative surveys can be done anywhere. You don't have to go at any particular time. And we'd love those surveys. We'd love your help getting those surveys done in between our 10 study sites. Because 10 study sites is not a lot of sampling for a 6 million acre area. And then our quantitative surveys are those that tell us how many butterflies do we see? And when are they flying? So the qualitative surveys are a partnership 
between the national parks and the butterflies and moths of North America. You can sign up for an account on this site and it's very similar to iNaturalist. You upload your photos, you mark where you saw them on a map. There's a drop down menu where you can say you're part of the Cascades Butterfly Project and we get a better idea of what's out there and the distribution of these butterflies. It's really great when you do this, if you can take a picture of the dorsal and ventral side of the butterfly. The difference between this and iNaturalist is they have experts who review your photos. So rather than having the community, it's an expert, which sometimes means you get a faster response. You can either say what you think the butterfly is or you don't need to say. And this person in our case, for this area, it's David Droppers, will identify the butterfly. And in about a day, you'll be able to see your observation on a map. Our quantitative butterfly surveys are accomplished using the Pollard walk method. So we have one, 10 one kilometer survey routes that are established along trails. We do mark them. This is a marker in the lower right. And, the, um, and we, we walk along this one kilometer route by five 200 meter segments. Somebody is called an observer. This happens to be Eddie Silawa walking down the trail and behind him, there will be two or three other people, one who will record and others who are backup netters. As the observer walks, he or she identifies every butterfly in an imaginary box in front of them. We do catch them sometimes because it's not always easy to identify them on the wing, as they say, but we catch them and release them and there's no harm to the butterfly. We try to monitor these survey routes at least once a week from snowmelt about July 4th until at least Labor Day when the first frost often comes, but sometimes into September. And it's really great if we could do it two or three times a week because we only do surveys when the weather's right for butterflies, which means low winds and above 60 degrees. We really wanna be out there when we have the best, excuse me, the best chance of seeing butterflies. So what have we learned? over the last 10 years. Before we continue, we'd like to hear your guesses as how many butterfly species do you think there are in Washington state? Whoa, that's pretty good. People are, about half of you got the right answer. The actual answer is there are 155 butterfly species in Washington state. And I think about 80 of those species occur in the Cascade Mountains. There are others that occur to the east and in lowlands, but in our study area, there's about 80 species we should expect to see. We've actually documented 57 species, which I think is pretty good. 46 in North Cascades and 44 in Mount Rainier. And because we've been doing this, another, um, another I think, product of or accomplishment of our program is we've been able to put these butterflies in abundance categories. We know which ones are most widespread, which ones we see the most often, and they're about 16 that we've seen across, um, across the whole study area that we would call most abundant. We also have learned a little bit about emergence patterns. And we've seen, as we expected, that butterfly flight times really depend on weather. 2015, as I mentioned before, was this really warm year when snowpack melted early, plants flowered early, and we also saw that butterflies flew earlier. Not all species, but many did. 
Generally, we see peak flight times mid-July to mid-August. And in 2015, they moved up by about three weeks from the end of June till mid-July. We also have found that some years have very high abundance, like 2018. We don't really know why, but that's a question that we have and we'd like researchers to help us and get involved in answering some of these questions. So I'm not going to show you all the butterflies, but in case you have favorites, I thought I'd show you what I call the most abundant butterflies. So these are, I went through all 10 routes and I took the five top butterflies and that's what you see on this list. And the number after each species, like after Anna's blue, you see a 10. That means Anna's blue has been documented on all 10 of our survey routes. As, to, as opposed to Snowberry Checker Spot at the bottom, which has only been seen in three routes. And those are the routes that are, um, I think, Sunrise Rim, Skyscraper Mountain, and Natchez Loop in Mount Rainier. We've also seen that um, butterfly numbers of species or species, species richness go up and down on different years. As I mentioned, there's 57 butterflies species, but if you're tempted to join our project, you don't have to learn all of them at once. We only see anywhere from 17 to 33 species on each route, and we have a list for each route. And in any one day, you'll generally only see maybe two to 10 species. So you can learn them more easily as they come out at different times during the year. This graph shows you from 2011 to 2020, and the y-axis is the number of species observed in one year. The different color lines are from the different routes. So you can see they go up and down over the years, and that Sock Mountain, that's the green, that actually generally has the highest number of species in any one survey but it doesn't have the highest number of species across all our sites. I think Easy Pass is the winner for that. I thought I'd show you just a few of the butterflies that we've been um, documenting. This is Anna's Blue and on the bottom left, and if you remember, this has been seen on all 10 routes. So this brownish butterfly with orange chevrons on the bottom of its dorsal wing is the female Anna's blue and the blue butterfly is the male female, the male Anna's blue. On the bottom you can see the ventral side and you might have noticed there's a lot of little blue butterflies out there so sometimes you really have to look at the ventral side to tell them apart. And the Anna's blue is characterized by these orange chevrons on the edges of the wings on the ventral side. On the right, you can see a map that shows the relative abundance of Anna's blue across all our study sites. And the size of the pink circle reflects what percent of Anna's blues are seen on that route. You can see all the sites at North Cascades are have larger pink circles. So it's more common to see an Anna's Blue up at North Cascades. Specifically, Sock Mountain and Easy Pass had over 30% of all the Anna's Blues that we've seen across 10 years. This is the Mormon Fritillary, which has been observed more frequently up at North Cascades. And you can see that by the larger circles, but we have observed it down in Mount Rainier. And this is a greater fritillary. If you can see the ventral side, it has these large silvery orbs on the hind wing. And that is one way besides size that distinguishes it from the lesser fritillary group. And that's what the Arctic fritillary is. And you can see on this that the Arctic fritillary, although it has been seen on, I think all 10 sites, it's more often that it's been seen down at Mount Rainier National Park. So as I mentioned, abundance, numbers of butterflies goes up and down with years. This is a graph extending from 2011 to 2020. 
and each of the columns has different colors reflecting the total number of butterflies that we noted on each of the different routes. 2011 and 2012 were very low abundance years, a little less than 2020, which was also a low year. But you can see 2018 was a very high year. Initially, when we started looking at these data, I thought, well, maybe 2011 and 12 were low because we really didn't know very many butterflies and we were just starting out. But now looking back at the weather and remembering those years, 2011 and 12 were cooler, wet years, similar to 2020. And I think that we were doing a good job on surveys. There just weren't very many butterflies out there. This is a slightly different way to look at abundance. And on this graph, the x-axis goes from June 4th to September 10th. And the y-axis goes from zero to 450 butterflies. And this is, and each line is a different route. Um, no, each year is, each color line is a different year. And so you can see on this that most of the years have peaks in this area between July 22nd and August 20th or so. And as I mentioned, that's when most butterflies fly. But this red line here, that is 2015. And that shows you where the peaks in 2015 extended from about June 30th to July 15th. Whoops. And plants also show this same pattern. So here are two graphs of different species. As I mentioned, not all species respond to the same environmental cues. On the top is Anna's blue, and the bottom is Arctic fritillary. And you can see on the top, or if you compare both of them, this light blue line is 2015. You can see both species emerged earlier and flew earlier in the year in very early July than they did in other years. But the Arctic fritillary graph looks different than the Anna's blue graph because Anna's blue has this peak in abundance in 2018, which Arctic fritillary doesn't. It looks like it had a peak in 2015, but all the other years look similar. So that's one of the um, things that we've been learning is which butterflies respond to which cues even though we can't explain it completely, we at least know that they must be responding to different cues because we're seeing different patterns in emergence and abundance. And I think I mentioned we're also looking at plants. We have about 10 to 15 focal plants we're looking at. Three of them you can see on this screen. Lupinus latifolius, or Arctic lupin, on the top. This is Bistort bistortoides that some people call stinky socks because, or stinky sneakers, because that's how they smell at the end of the season when they're dying. And then meadow daisy or Erigeron peregrinus. And they seem to have been following about the same pattern as the butterflies. The top graph here is the three species you can see, the bistort, the lupin, and the Erigeron. The solid lines are 2015 and the dotted lines are 2018. And I just chose to compare two years here. But you can see the peaks in flowering in 2015 were about June 25th to July 5th for all three species. When we go to 2018, the peaks were a little different, but they were later than 2015. The bottom graph is just lupins for five different years. And the different colors signify different years. But you can see, well, you can see a couple of things here. You can see that peaks occurred slightly different times. And in this particular case, the lupin is lower on 2015. And at least for me on 2015, I felt like I saw a lot of flowers come out, but then they dried up quickly because it was a very dry year. And a lot of huckleberries seem to dry up that year too without forming full fruits. So that's something that we're trying to track on um, our butterfly surveys. Are plants and butterflies reacting at the same rate? Will they be able to adapt to climate or will there be a discontinuity between them? 
So I think that's about all I have for you on our butterfly project, but I do want to invite all of you, if you would like to join us, we're always looking for more volunteers. We especially need some people up at North Cascades. And all you have to do to be able to volunteer is have a desire to learn, the ability to hike four to eight miles and up a few hundred or a few thousand feet in elevation. It'd be great if you had your own survey partner. And we ask that you come about four times and that means once a week, one day a week. And that way, if you come back each week, it'll be easier to learn the butterflies. If you do decide to join us, we can generally provide a camping spot for you at Mount Rainier. And this year at North Cascades, I think we're also able to provide camping at Goodell Campground. So my contact information is there and it would be great to have you join us. And this last slide just shows you all the people that have contributed to our project. We've received support from Washington's National Park Fund since the inception of this project. Also, um, the National Park Service. We partner with the Forest Service, and we've been partnering with Dr. Leslie Reese at Georgetown and NABNET for data storage. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rochefort, that was a fascinating presentation and I really appreciate the uh, detail of the year by year reports. Really feel like we were immersed into your project and really seeing just what you're learning about day by day. Um, we're now uh, open for questions. Um, please enter them in the Q&A box below. We have a time, time for just a few, but here we have from um, Michael. Have you compared data with some of the Pacific Northwest prairie pollinator studies? No, that's a really great idea. And I don't know who to contact for that, but if you told me, that would be really great for me. I'm trying to reach out with this network. So that would be great. Okay, great. So Michael, if you have more information, oh, he, he uh, writes back, I will send you a link, great. Uh, good collaboration, uh, you know, on the fly here. Super. Uh, another, um, Lisa writes, thank you for a great presentation. You're welcome. It's my and, <laughs> the, um, um, I was struck by one of the graphs that you presented uh, showed a peak, I think it was in 2018, with numbers of, of butterflies. Was there something unique about that year or the techniques you used to sample? Or do you think, do you think that was a real difference? I, I think it was a real difference. And Leslie Reese at Georgetown told me she heard from a lot of people across the US that 2018 was a very big butterfly year. So I'm not, I'm just starting to analyze the data, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure on that. But but that's a question I want to answer. Oh, okay, uh, super interesting. And, and also I was wondering, um, I believe you said that uh, data was um, being collected, started being collected, was it in 2011? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Are, are there, do you have any sense of, you know, drawing the line backwards over time? Because I was also struck by the climate data showing changes, you know, in the middle of the last century. Um, do you have any sense of drawing that line back, um, you know, to what might be happening? Well, I can't say specifically for us, but Dr. Matt Forrester at University of Nevada, Reno, just published a study and he, for the West, and he tried to take all historic records and he's shown that butterfly abundance has decreased over the last four decades. Okay. And in particular, he thinks that um, warming falls might be contributing to the decrease, but during warmer summers, he saw more, there were more abundant butterflies, but it may be that the warming falls cause the uh, host plants to dry up more quickly and that might be something with it. And, and also Bob Pyle told me that one of the reasons that we may have had fewer butterflies, say in 2020 and some of the wet years, is he calls it the rot factor. And he published something in the Xerces Society newsletter saying that wet springs, as it's getting warmer, might cause 
caterpillars or overwintering eggs or larvae to rot. So I'm not sure. So, so changes are due to changes in the plants? Plants or the, it could be the plant, host plants, or it yeah. could be the, uh, the weather just causing the butterfly larvae to rot in the spring. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, some other questions coming in here. Uh, Julia asks, can you describe the life cycle with regards to geography of one species? Oh, do you mean whether some of them, uh, whether they migrate? Is that the question? Um, I'm not sure, Let's see. I mean, a lot of our butterflies um, overwinter as eggs or larvae. Okay. But often in the same, very close to where we are. Um, you know, it's not, it's not like a monarch. Although there is one butterfly and now it's, um, sorry, I'm having, there's one butterfly that we observed last year at Sunrise Rim that is um, Coronis fritillary. And that is very interesting because it generally lays its eggs low down on the east side in the sagebrush. And then the females fly up into the mountains after they've mated, but then they go back down low and lay their eggs there. So I think there are a variety of different life cycles. Others that you might start to see now, like um, sadder commas are starting to come out. They actually overwinter as adults under the bark of trees. So I think there are a lot of, there's a lot of variety out there. Oh, okay, great, great. Thank you, thank you very much. And again, thank you so much, Regina, for sharing your expertise and experience uh, with us today. Um, I wanna let you all know that our next virtual field trip will be in May on May 12th, well, where we'll join uh, Jeff Antonella's lab to explore the Nisqually watershed at Mount Rainier National Park. I hope you all uh, will join us uh, next week. I mentioned earlier that next week is our uh, WNPF online auction. The auction starts on uh, Monday, April 19th at four o'clock and runs through the week. There are some amazing packages and experiences to uh, explore in addition to backpacks and boot, boots and hikes and guided tours. There's also artwork and jewelry and culinary experiences. So there's really something for everyone. Bidding again starts as you'll see on the screen there on Monday the 19th at four and runs through the week until uh, seven o'clock on Friday, April 23rd, where uh, we'll join together, all park enthusiasts join together to celebrate Washington's National Park Fund and our three amazing national parks. And hear again from Dr. Rochefort about volunteerism in our parks. And that's our, our project for the Raise the Paddle uh, on uh, that Friday. April 23rd. So I hope you can join us on Friday uh, or bid on these great items on our auction through the week. Information is at our website, www.npf.org. Go to events uh, and you'll see how to sign up to bid and how to sign up to join us on the 23rd on our Friday celebration. I also just want to make, say in summary that thanks to you, our amazing supporters in 2020, WNPF gave over $650,000 to support projects at Mount Rainier, Olympic and North Cascades National Parks. Uh, thank you so much for your ongoing support and thank you for attending today. And if you need, want uh, more information about our organization, go to wnpf.org. Thank you again and have a great day.